Chapter 2, Palankar Valley The sun rose the next morning with a glorious conflagration of pink and yellow. The air was fresh, sweet and very cold. Ice edged the streams and small pools were completely frozen over. After a breakfast of porridge, Aragorn returned to the glen and examined the charred area. The morning light revealed no new details, so he started for home. The rough game trail was faintly worn and, in places, non-existent. Because it had been forged by animals, it often backtracked and took long detours, yet for all its flaws it was still the fastest way out of the mountains. The spine was one of the only places that King Galbatorix could not call his own. Stories were still told about how half his army disappeared after marching into its ancient forest. A cloud of misfortune and bad luck seemed to hang over it. Though the trees grew tall and the sky shone brightly, few people could stay in the spine for long without suffering an accident. Aragorn was one of those few, not through any particular gift, it seemed to him, but because of persistent vigilance and sharp reflexes. He had hiked in the mountains for years, yet he was still wary of them. Every time he thought they had surrendered their secrets, something happened to upset his understanding of them, like the stone's appearance. He kept up a brisk pace, and the league steadily disappeared. In the late evening, he arrived at the edge of a precipitous ravine. The Anora River rushed by far below, heading to Palankar Valley. Gorged with hundreds of tiny streams, the river was a brute force. Battling against the rocks and boulders that barred its way, a low rumble filled the air. He camped in a thicket near the ravine and watched the moon rise before going to bed. It grew colder over the next day and a half. Aragorn travelled quickly and saw little of the wary wildlife. A bit past noon, he heard the Igualda Falls blanketing everything with a dull sound of thousand splashes. The trail led him onto a moist slate outcropping, which the river sped past, flinging itself into empty air and down mossy cliffs. Before him lay Palankar Valley, exposed like an unrolled map. The base of the Igualda Falls, more than half a mile below, was the northernmost point of the valley. A little ways from the falls was Carver Hall, a cluster of brown buildings. White smoke rose from the chimneys, defiant of the wilderness around it. At this height, farms were small, square patches, no bigger than the end of his finger. The land around them was tan or sandy, where dead grass swayed in the wind. The Enora River wound from the falls towards Palankar's southern end, reflecting great strips of sunlight. Far in the distance, it flowed past the village Therensford and the lonely mountain Utgard. Beyond that, he knew only that it turned north and ran to the sea. After a pause, Aragorn left the outcropping and started down the trail, grimacing at the descent. When he arrived at the bottom, soft dusk was creeping over everything, blurring colours and shapes into grey masses. Carver Hall's lights shimmered nearby in the twilight, the houses cast long shadows. Aside from Therensford, Carver Hall was the only village in Palankar Valley. The settlement was secluded and surrounded by harsh, beautiful land. Few travelled here except merchants and trappers. The village was composed of stout log buildings with low roofs, some thatched, others shingled. Smoke billowed from the chimneys, giving the air a woody smell. The buildings had wide porches where people gathered to talk and conduct business. Occasionally, a window brightened as a candle or lamp was lit. Aragorn heard men talking loudly in the evening air, while wives scurried to fetch their husbands, scolding them for being late. Aragorn wove his way between the houses to the butcher's shop, a broad, thick-beamed building, Overhead, the chimney belched black smoke. He pushed the door open. The spacious room was warm and well lit by a fire snapping into a stone fireplace. A bare counter stretched across the far side of the room. The floor was strewn loose with straw. Everything was scrupulously clean, as if the owner spent his leisure time digging in obscure crannies for minuscule pieces of filth. Behind the counter stood the butcher Sloane. A small man, he wore a cotton shirt and a long, blood-stained smock. An impressive array of knives swung from his belt. He had a sallow, pockmarked face and his black eyes were suspicious. He polished the counter with a ragged cloth. Sloane's mouth twisted as Aragorn entered. Well, the mighty hunter joins the rest of us mortals. How many did you brag this time? None, was Aragorn's curt reply. He had never liked Sloane. The butcher always treated him with disdain, as if he was something unclean. A widower, Sloane seemed to care for only one person, his daughter, Katrina, on whom he doted. I'm amazed, said Sloane, affected with astonishment. He turned his back on Aragorn to scrape something off the wall. And that's your reason for coming here? Yes, admitted Aragorn uncomfortably. If that's the case, let's see your money. Sloane tapped his fingers when Aragorn shifted his feet and remained silent. 
Come on, either you have it or you don't. Which is it? I don't really have any money, but I do. What? No money? The butcher cut him off sharply. And you expect to buy meat? Are the other merchants giving away their wares? Should I just hand you the goods without charge? Besides, he said abruptly, it's late. Come back tomorrow with money. and I'm closed for the day. Aragon glanced at him. I can't wait until tomorrow, Sloane. It'll be worth your while, though. I found something to pay you with. He pulled out the stone with a flourish and set it gently on the scarred counter where it gleamed with light from the dancing flames. Stole it, more likely, muttered Sloane, leaning forward with an interested expression. Ignoring the comment, Aragon asked, Will this be enough? Sloane picked up the stone and gauged its weight speculatively. He ran his hands over its smoothness and inspected the white veins. With a calculating look, he set it down. It's pretty, but how much is it worth? I don't know, admitted Aragon, but no one would have gone through the trouble of shaping it unless it had some value. Obviously, said Sloane with exaggerated patience, but how much value? Since you don't know, I suggest you find a trader who does or take my offer of three crowns. That's a miser's bargain. It'll be worth at least ten times that, protested Aragon. Three crowns would not even buy enough meat to last a week. Sloan shrugged. If you don't like my offer, wait until the traders arrive. Either way, I'm tired of this conversation. The traders were a nomadic group of merchants and entertainers who visited Carver Hall every spring and winter. They bought whatever excess the villagers and local farmers had managed to grow or make and sold what they needed to live through another year. Seeds, animals, fabric, and supplies like salt and sugar. But Aragon did not want to wait until they arrived. It could be a while, and his family needed the meat now. Fine. I accept, he said, he snapped. Good, I'll get you the meat. Now, not that it matters, but where did you find this? Two nights ago in the spine. Get out, demanded Sloane, pushing the stone away. He stomped furiously to the end of the counter and started scrubbing old bloodstains off a knife. Why, asked Aragon. He drew the stone closer as if to protect it from Sloane's wrath. I won't deal with anything you bring back from those damned mountains. Take your sorcerer's stone elsewhere. Sloane's hands suddenly slipped and he cut a finger on the knife, but he seemed not to notice. He continued to scrub, staining the blade with fresh blood. You refuse to sell to me? Yes, unless you pay with coins. Sloane growled and hefted the knife, sliding away. Go before I make you. The door behind them slammed open. Aragon whirled around, ready for more trouble. In stomped Horst, a hulking man. Sloane's daughter, Katrina, a tall girl of sixteen, trailed behind him with a determined expression. Aragon was surprised to see her. She usually absented from herself from any arguments involving her father. Sloane glanced at them warily, then started to accuse Aragon. He won't... Quiet, announced Horst in a rumbling voice, cracking his knuckles at the same time. He was Carver Hall Smith, and his thick neck and scarred leather apron attested. His powerful arms were bare to the elbow, a great expanse of hairy muscular chest was visible through the top of his shirt, a black beard carelessly trimmed, roiled and knotted like his jaw muscles. Sloane, what have you done now? Nothing. He gave Aragon a murderous gaze, then spat. This boy came in here and started badgering me. I asked him to leave, but he won't budge. I even threatened him, and he still ignored me. Sloane seemed to shrink as he looked at Horse. Is this true? demanded the smith. No, replied Aragon. I offered this stone as payment for some meat, and he accepted it. When I told him that I'd found it in the spine, he refused to even touch it. What difference does it make where it came from? Horse looked at the stone curiously, then returned his attention to the butcher. Why won't you trade with him, Sloane? I've no love for the spine myself, but if it's a question of the stone's worth, it'll back. I'll back it with my own money. The question hung in the air for a moment. Then Sloane licked his lips and said, This is my own store. I can do whatever I want. Katrina stepped out from behind Horse and tossed back her auburn hair like a spray of molten copper. Father, Aragon is willing to pay. Give him the meat, and then we can go have supper. Sloane's eyes narrowed dangerously. Go back to the house. This is none of your business. I said go. Katrina's face hardened, then she marched out of the room with a stiff back. Aragon watched with disapproval, but dared not interfere. Horse tugged at his beard before saying reproachfully, Fine, you can deal with me. What were you going to get, Aragon? His voice reverberated through the room. As much as I could. Horse pulled out a purse and counted out a pile of coins. Give me your best roasts and steaks. Make sure that it's enough to fill Aragon's pack. The butcher hesitated, his gaze darting between Horst and Aragon. Not selling to me would be a very bad idea, stated Horst. Glowering venomously, Sloane slipped into the back room. A frenzy of chopping, rapping, and low cursing reached them. After several uncomfortable minutes, he returned with an armful of wrapped meat. 
His face was expressionless as he accepted horse money, then proceeded to clean his knife, pretending that they were not there. Horse scooped up the meat and walked outside. Aragon hurried behind him, carrying his pack and the stone. The crisp night air rolled over their faces, refreshing after the stuffy shop. Thank you, Horst. Uncle Garrow will be pleased. Horst laughed quietly. Don't thank me. I've wanted to do that for a long time. Sloane's a vicious troublemaker, and it does him good to be humbled. Katrina heard what was happening and ran to fetch me. Good thing I came. The two of you were almost at blows. Unfortunately, I doubt he'll serve you or any of your family the next time you go in there, even if you do have coins. Why did he explode like that? We've never been friendly, but he's always taken our money, and I've never seen him treat Katrina that way, said Aragon, opening the top of the pack. Horse shrugged. Ask your uncle. He knows more about it than I do. Aragon stuffed the meat into his pack. Well now, I have one more reason to hurry home to solve this mystery. Here, this is rightfully yours. He preferred the stone. Horse chuckled. <laughs> No, keep your strange rock. As for payment, Albridge plans to leave for Feenster next spring. He wants to become a master smith, and I'm going to need an assistant. You can come and work off the debt on your spare days. Aragon bowed slightly, delighted. Horst had two signs, Albrick and Baldor, both of whom worked in his forge. Taking one's place was a generous offer. Again, thank you. I look forward to working with you. He was glad that there was a way for him to pay Horst. His uncle would never accept charity. Then Aragorn remembered what his cousin had told him before he had left on the hunt. Roran wanted me to give Katrina a message, but since I can't, can you get it to her? Of course. He wants her to know that he'll come into town as soon as the merchants arrive and that he will see her then. That all? Aragorn was slightly embarrassed. No. He also wants her to know that she is the most beautiful girl he has ever seen and that he thinks of nothing else. Horse's face broke into a broad grin and he winked at Aragorn. Getting serious, isn't he? Yes, sir, Aragorn answered with a quick smile. Could you also give her my thanks? It was nice of her to stand up to her father for me. I hope that she isn't punished because of it. Roran would be furious if I got her into trouble. I wouldn't worry about it. Sloane doesn't know that she called me, so I doubt he'll be too hard on her. Before you go, will you sup with us? I'm sorry, but I can't. Garrow is expecting me, said Aragorn. Tying the top of the pack, he hoisted it onto his back and started down the road, raising his hand in farewell. The meat slowed him down, but he was eager to be home, and renewed vigour filled his steps. The village ended abruptly, and he left its warm lights behind. The pearlescent moon peeked over the mountains, bathing the land in a ghostly reflection of daylight. Everything looked bleached and flat. Near the end of the journey, he turned off the road which continued south. A simple path led straight through the waist-high grass and up a knoll, almost hidden by the shadows of the protective elm trees. He crested the hill and saw a gentle light shining from his home. The house had a shingled roof and a brick chimney. Eaves hung over the whitewashed wa walls, shadowing the ground below. One side of the enclosed porch was filled with split wood, ready for the fire. A jumble of farm tools cluttered the other side. The house had been abandoned for half a century when they moved in after Garrow's wife Marion died. It was ten miles from Carver Hall, far farther than anyone else's. People considered the distance dangerous because the family could not rely on help from the village in times of trouble, but Aragorn's uncle would not listen. A hundred feet from the house, in a dull-coloured barn, lived two horses, Berka and Bra, with chickens and a cow. Sometimes there was also a pig, but they had been unable to afford one this year. A wagon sat wedged between two stalls. On the edge of their fields, a thick line of trees traced along the Enora River. He saw a light move behind a window as he warily reached the porch. Uncle, it's Aragorn, let me in. A small shutter slid back f for a second, then the door swung inward. Garrow stood with his hand in the door, his warm clothes hung on him like rags on a stick frame. A lean, hungry face with intense eyes grazed out from under the greying hair. He looked like a man who had been partly mummified before it was discovered that he was still alive. Roar and sleeping, was his answer to Aragorn's inquiring glance. A lantern flickered on a wood table so old that the grain stood up in tiny ridges like a giant fingerprint. Near a wood stove were rows of cooking utensils tacked onto the wall with homemade nails. A second door opened to the rest of the house. The floor was made of boards polished smooth by years of tramping feet. Aragorn pulled off his pack and took out the meat. What's this? Did you buy meat? Where did you get the money? Asked his uncle harshly as he saw the wrapped packages. Aragorn took a breath before answering. No, horse bought it for us. You let him pay for it. I told you before I won't beg for our food. If we can't feed ourselves, we might as well move into town. Before you can turn around twice, they'll be sending us used clothes and asking if we'll be able to get through the winter. Garrow's face paled with anger. I didn't accept charity, snapped Aragorn. Horst agreed to let me work off the debt this spring. He needs someone to help him because Albrecht is going away. 
And where will you get the time to work for him? Are you going to ignore all the things that need to be done here? Asked Garrow, forcing his voice down. Aragon hung his bow and quiver on the hooks beside the front door. I don't know how I'll do it, he said irritably. Besides, I found something that could be worth some money. He set the stone on the table. Garrow bowed over it. The hungry look on his face became ravenous, and his fingers moved with a strange twitch. You found this in the spine? Yes, said Aragon. He explained what happened. And to make matters worse, I lost my best arrow. I'll have to make more before long. They stared at the stone in the near darkness. How was the weather? asked his uncle, lifting the stone. His hands tightened around it like he was afraid it would suddenly disappear. Cold, was Aragorn's reply. It didn't snow, but it froze each night. Garrow looked worried by the news. Tomorrow you'll have to help Roran finish harvesting the barley. If we can get the squash picked too, the frost won't bother us. He passed the stone to Aragorn. Here, keep it. When the traders come, we'll find out what it's worth. Selling it's probably the best thing to do. The less we're involved with magic, the better. Why did Horse pay for the meat? It took only a moment for Aragorn to explain his argument with Sloane. I just don't understand what angered him so. Garrow shrugged. Sloane's wife, Ismira, went over the Igualda Falls a year before you were brought here. He hasn't been near the spine since, nor had anything to do with it. But that's no reason to refuse payment. I think he wanted to give you trouble. Aragorn swayed and blearily and said, It's good to be back. Garrow's eyes softened. And he nodded. Aragorn stumbled to his room, pushed the stone under his bed, then fell onto the mattress. Home. For the first time since before the hunt, he relaxed completely as sleep overtook him.